Right, welcome one and all. We're uh, just about on the start time, so I'll do the introduction. Um, for those that don't know our speaker, Rex is all the way from Limerick, Maine, in uh, the USA, and um, has uh, has come over to uh, to on his way to France. So he's he's stopping off here for a few days on his way to France. And uh, uh, when uh, the opportunity to get Rex to speak, uh, we couldn't turn that down. So uh, I've, I've attended Rex's talks before. They're always exciting, fun, uh, and active. I'll uh, I'll leave that hanging for the moment and not sp sp steal his sandwiches. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank Rex for, for doing the talk today. And uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. You give him a very warm welcome. Rex from America. Thank you. Uh, and my full name is Rex Harper, so welcome to my university. I hope you like this. <laughs> uh, I broke the the uh, machine down the cash the little cash store a little while ago because I forgot my pin number, and it broke. And they had to call the manager and everything else. I said, I claim dip my dip, diplomatic immunity. My <laughs> university, I can do anything I want here. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I was asked to do a talk about QRP. How many people here are really QRPers? So I am preaching to the choir. I mean, how many people are not QRPers? One, two. You're a QRPer now. Okay, yeah. You can't go back. <laughs> <laughs> he just got his club membership. Um, so uh, you know, again, this is this is a sort of a little bit. I'm going to try to do a little introductory about how I got there. I'm going to try to do it fast. Uh, and then um, and then talk about QRP in general. All right, so starting off, I mean, three QRP, three little words. Background, that's where I grew up in Cape Elizabeth, Maine. That's the view from the beach to the house, and that's the view from the house to the beach. So that's the Atlantic Ocean, and that's the very famous Portland headlight right there that everybody sees when they see a picture of a lighthouse in America is that lighthouse. I grew up loving the water. I knew that place like the back of my hand, knew where every nook and cranny was, every crab, every lobster, every urchin, every everything. That was my world. I, I lived to breathe the water, H2O. I was gonna be a marine biologist or an oceanographer in the Navy, okay? My father was a Navy officer when he retired, when he moved here. And I thought that's the perfect world for me. So I went there, this is a picture of me and my father in 1964, I was 14 years old. My father was only five, six. <laughs> I was a little run. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I tried to join the Navy. They run me through the, all the tests for two days. They stuck me, prodded me and everything else, but I was just too short. They didn't take me. Um, but um, I liked sport, um, uh, scouting. I was the signal, the official, troop signalman. I knew wigwag. I knew Morse code. I knew I could do blinker light because I grew up on a Navy base and the Navy signalman taught me. Um, so I was still into it. But in 1966, um, a language called BASIC was invented in Dartmouth College. And our little high school in Maine got the, one of the first three terminals to Dartmouth College to try out BASIC computer language on high school kids. I was 16 years old. And Man, oh man, I ate that up. And it was nothing but computers after that. I, I was a friend with my best friend, had a full, he was an extra, had a full Heath kit with digital displays on everything in his, in his um, bedroom. I used to do that, but after that it was, this is the love of my life right here. This is the GE timesharing computer in Dartmouth. Um, and I was just, I mean, I, me and computers just got along. This is the IBM 1130. When I went to school, I was rejected from the Navy, so I couldn't afford to go to be an oceanographer or a bi marine biologist. So I went to become an electrical engineer. That was my backup, because I was always into electronics. And that's the 1130 I played with. That's the 11, that's the IBM 370, which I played with. And that's the, the TI 960A mini computer that I worked on on my first job at Texas Instruments. I was a computer nerd. Amateur radio was long gone. Marine biology was long gone. Um, all that stuff. But as an engineer, I, I, I got pigeonholed. You worked on a project. It might take you 
six months, it might take you a year. And I don't know about you guys, but when I work on something for six months or a year and it's the same thing every single day, I get extremely bored. I mean, I have a short attention span for those kinds of projects. Uh, so anyway, I was still an engineer at TI and I bought this thing, an Altair 8800 microcomputer. And I finally had a computer in my very own house. I didn't have to ask anybody to do anything. I could write all kinds of stuff. And I, I wrote lots of software for it. Apple II came out, fell in love with that one. Day one, the minute I saw it, became an instant dealer and I sold those for 15 years. I quit my job as an engineer, programmer, and became a full-time computer salesperson. Had my own store, 33 people working for me. Two stores, 300 miles apart. And then this little guy came out, which is basically the microcontroller. That's a, that's a PIC microcontroller. Fell in love with those. And my, my fun thing is to, is to put a brain, a smart brain in something very small. And that was just about the cat's ass. Excuse my French. Uh, so I like to have fun in, with computers and everything else. I still was not anywhere near radios and in amateur radio, uh, but then this came along. Yeah. I was a full-time programmer and I was the first programmer on Simon doing the actual source code for Simon. And my real-time job got in the way, so I had to give it back to, to the powers that be. So I'm not officially on Simon, but Super Simon, my name's on the patent. I did all the electronics and all the software. Plus one, I did all the game design, all the electronics and that. Laboom, very inappropriate game nowadays. <laughs> they did not sell very many. It was a very rare game. Uh, I happen to have one, but very inappropriate these days. Um, but I became a, a toy designer, electronic toy designer. For Did that for about six, seven years. And it was fun. I mean, every day I went to work and I played whatever I was inventing that day. And usually the, a game wouldn't last more than three or four weeks in development and I'd have it done. Um, but that was the first time I really, really experienced fun on the job. Um, I had to, I, I gave up being a toy designer when it, not, when it was not fun because all of a sudden everything was four switches, four LEDs and four, LED, four lights, and that was it. It was either that or you jumped to video games. And, and uh, anyway, so I sort of lost out. I went back to work as an R&D engineer. I needed money, <laughs> um, but it was boring. Then I had big changes in my life. Got married, had a kid, needed a house, all that kind of stuff. So I had to have priorities. And my kits became larger. My projects became larger. That right there is the house I built. It's a kit, paid 15 grand for it. There's a log cabin I built on the property. That was a kit, paid 9,000 for that one. There's a Quonset hut full of stuff. That was a $6,000 kit. That was a long, that was a big job. And these are the coops and the barn I made for my wife. That, those were not kids. But I, I was still doing big things, still not really into radio. Um, I was doing, a, again, a corporate job for my... Everybody know what the term AH means? When you have somebody, you know that they're an AH. You just call them an AH. <laughs> I worked for about four AHs in a row uh, for these small companies. And they were all AHs. And the last guy, the last guy, uh, it, was, it just got really terrible. So I had to give that up. But I was working on a project and I was trying to mesh some microprocessors to, together. And I thought, gee, I could use those QRP, um, not QRP, but the amateur radio VHF frequencies where they have all kinds of nice transmitters and receivers already on modules already approved by the FCC and all that kind of stuff. So I said, I'll go down and check that out at the amateur radio meeting. And quit. by accident, they weren't having a meeting that night. They were having testing. So some guy said, hey, give me a $5.25 and sit down for a test. And he was a nice guy. He was friendly. So I did. I got a license. I was a no-code tech. Uh, that was 1995. I think it was in September of 1995. Um, so I'm, I jumped ahead a little bit. Uh, because at first it was very boring because I went to the meetings and all these guys were fighting about how much money they're going to put in the repeater, you know, the antenna's down and what are the dues? And what are the dues going to increase? 
I was not having any fun at all until somebody mentioned QRP. That one of the other builders in the club said, you want to know about QRP. And he had just bought one of those kits for doing the, uh, uh, from uh, Tucson area packet uh, for doing the RIDI off, off of your computer. He was just jumping up and down about that thing. It only cost 25 bucks. So he showed it to me and I sort of got into QRP. And then, you know, this is the original. I mean, somebody, somebody said, they were at Rosh, uh, Rishworth when I brought that. That's the original Tuna Tin 2. And I brought that here to England for a visit. And uh, But I found out about these inexpensive little things, you know, little projects you could build in a night or two. And that's when all of a sudden I became a QRP here. And that was about 96, I think it was. 97, I think you can see right up there in 1997. This is the very first design I had, which was... I was always still doing a lot of digital stuff. And this is a digital breadboard that looked like a sort of a split version of the old Radio Shack breadboard that came in about yay big. And it was on that, that uh, chem board that was absolutely incredibly difficult to work with and cut and machine and sand and all to put it and make something nice. So I made one that just drops into an Altoids tin. I call it the Toys board. Um, so that was my first foray into QRP and QRP kitting. Um, but I was still all alone out in the sticks of Maine. I wanted to talk to people. I wanted to, you know, group. And that's, I mean, how many belong to a QRP club other than GQRP club? Okay. Do you have anybody in your local area? Do you have a Elmer's or friends? And you, I didn't either. There was 18 hams in my town and no one would talk to me, especially about QRP. Um, so I put a blurb out and I, I went and found all the people, all the QRPers from the list who lived in Maine. I sent them an invitation saying, let's, let's meet up at a public park or a private park. So I created this whole thing called LobsterCon. And, <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden I had so many friends, I didn't know what to do with them all. Um, but this became a community, okay? So, I mean, I'm a, I'm a mover and shaker in Maine and New England and the US, but it's because I really wanted to, to meet up with other QRPers and, and, and learn. So I have people who are not QRPers come to this to eat that. <laughs> but anyway, so I have typically 50, 60 people who come. Sometimes it's up to 100 uh, for a little weekend party of camping and operating. And so sometimes we build and sometimes we don't. Um, but, uh, you know, the camaraderie in QRP, I think, is just amazing. I mean, I, I was overwhelmed when I first met George and Graham and, and uh, Tony Fishpool when they came over to the US for the first time. And that was about 1997 when I was trying to hawk that stupid little board that fit in the tent. Uh, but they liked it. So uh, we got along pretty well together. But the whole idea about QRP, I think, is it's friendly. I mean, there's no hidden agendas here. Everybody, you know, like Sprat, you, you send in your articles, there's really nice building, really nice stories about it. And anybody who you meet who's a QRP here died in the wall is anxious to impart information, to, to bring knowledge to the table, whatever it is. And here's a case where I kept trying to do something very simple. It was poo-pooed by the powers that be. I wanted to do a seminar where everybody would build something in the same, the same something in a room. And I said, I'm going for the world's record. I want to build it in the ballroom where everybody who attends four days in May would be there. And they shot me down about five times in a row. Steve, who was it, Steve? Um, who was a um, GKRP club member, but was also um, the president of ARCI for a little while. And, huh? No, it wasn't Dave, Steve. I can't remember his name, Steve. He was a nice guy, yeah. IT guy, uh, you know, into multimedia. Anyway, he finally became president of ARCI and he says, you know, I have this idea about doing a, a build in the seminar room and, and a 20 meter transmitter. I said, oh, I had that same dream. So he let me do it. There's 244 people in the ballroom all building a 20 meter transmitter without a soldering iron. That's a classic. Later on, I came here and did the same kind of a deal, but a little bit simpler because the we don't have tables and stuff at Rishworth. So I did a, a UK uh, world's biggest build-a-thon. Whoops. <laughs> uh, that was a, that was a, uh, this is my very first gathering. This was 
18 people at the first, very first lobster pond. And you can't see it. This little toddler is bigger than my daughter. My daughter was on my back in a backpack the whole time I'm trying to cook lobsters and have you know meetings with all my friends. I'm wearing my daughter, but she was only seven months, I think, something like that. Um, but it started off small. Anything starts off small. Six, 18 people showed up. This is a public park at, at Portland Headlight, the, the famous headlight. Public park, they brought their own stuff and we had a really lovely day. Um, just talking and, and uh, doing QRP stuff. Then I went off the deep end, okay? <laughs> um, NorCal, Northern California Com Computer Club, uh, QRP Club, um, they had this back to the future thing and they did a tuna tin too. They did a hearing A5 and a CB slider. And I kept thinking, what about the sardine sender? That was my thing, because I'm from Maine, and Maine's got sardine canning companies. Well, uh, I tried to do that, but I couldn't find anybody who had canning machines. But when I finally did, I found out it was way too expensive to try to do that because of the logistics. But in talking with the Sardine Canning Museum, I managed to nudge a tuna round can seamer out of them. And so I now was a proud owner of a tuna canning machine that was manual. So I didn't have to have big giant electricity mains for it and all that kind of jazz. So I started designing things in a tuna tin. And of course I got fairly well known for it. This is all being taken from a, from a, a local grocery store where I went in there at night, and took all their tuna can off and put mine on, took a picture. Um, but the whole the whole idea is again i'm trying to make stuff fun and and i think what i do about fun you know goes on the other foot people have fun putting together qrp stuff and it doesn't take rocket science and most of most of the stuff is pretty well documented i'm not saying all some of mine are not documented people have bought my board today there's no documentation at all because it just came off the press three days i don't know one week ago because I, I, it was two days before I came here. I had, didn't have time to fully document it. This is Huntsville, Alabama. You know, I go down there, I do a billathon, do a little talk, and we have, we're always getting together with food. This is, uh, this is the barbecue night. And uh, I had Louisiana barbecue and their famous uh, vanilla pudding with bananas, which I don't understand that because I was eating that since I was a little kid. <laughs> There's nothing famous about that, but it's a specialty in Alabama. Um, but the idea, and there's me, that's, I'm, that's me, I'm manning the GQRP club booth, and anybody know where that is? <clears throat> that's Gala Shields, Scotland. Okay, I came over and Graham and I tootled up to Scotland, and we did a little show up there, and I didn't understand a word that anybody said. Yeah. I, went, I went to dinner with Graham and Roy and who was Roy's buddy? I can't remember his name now. Yes, he passed away. Anyway, we're at a dinner at a pub, and the three of them, Yorkshire men and these two Scottish men, they're talking along, you know, and I'm eating my fish or whatever. And we get in the taxi and on the way back to the hotel. And I said, Graham, just exactly what were you talking about? I I got about every fifth word in that thing, and I was guessing. <laughs> but anyway, the idea. You know, now this is again, there's my tuna cans and stuff in the QRP. But you know, it's the fact that there's there's a lot of stuff floating around there that's inexpensive. Well, I think I'm getting ahead of myself again. It's it's simple. This the stuff is really simple. I mean, there's no way you're gonna put your head into a ICOM 705, pull the cover off and do anything with it, unless you're a lot better engineer than I am, because I mean it's just it, this stuff is just impossible to work with. So really all the commercial stuff out there becomes, in essence, unless it's old, but it becomes an appliance. You know, you don't really learn much from an appliance. You get down in, you know, this is the, the easy to build stuff, it's the simple stuff. And it's educational because you get to know the circuit. I mean, I, I've got, you know, oscillator circuits and, and all that kind of stuff just floating around in my brain cells from doing it so much. Um, but again, in college, I stayed away from RF. I stayed away from analog. I, I didn't care a hoot about that. I was into computers. I took every programming course, every language course, every math course I could get my hands on. I stayed away from the analog stuff. 
But QRP has, has brought me back into that world. And as a professional, I was always in the computer, so I didn't really do anything analog. Um, and of course, I say cheap for brevity, but okay, let's say economical. Okay, some QRPers will say cheap. Some people, QRPers, will say ultra cheap. You know, you couldn't even sell them a two dollar something or other. Um, so that leads us to show you a demonstration. What's my time, Mr. Timekeeper? Twenty minutes past. Twenty minutes past. I've only been here for twenty minutes. <laughs> okay, let's do a brief. Anybody got a question that I that I haven't touched on and I should have touched on? Well, I got a question I finally. Pardon? I, I don't know about QRP, so I didn't explain what QRP is. Is it, is it a company of range? No. A range of <laughs> Okay. Anybody? QRP is the is the shorthand for reducing power. Normally, back in the old days, you know, you'd say QRP with an exclamation point would be I am reducing power. QRP with a question mark is, should I reduce my power? Because in America, the rules and regulations say that you only maintain enough power to establish the and continue the contact. You don't use excessive power. So legally, you're supposed to reduce your dial down from 2000 watts down to just what it takes to do the job. Because every time you put you know, X amount of power out that's not necessary, you're splattering some guy over there who's trying to use the same frequency, okay? So you're trying to keep it as local as possible and you can't do that when you always push the knob. My mother wanted a stove that you push the knob and every burner came on high and the oven came on broil because that, she was always a fast cook <laughs> and that's why. But, but the point is a lot of guys don't think they can operate unless they got an amplifier. Now we think a five watt amplifier is great, okay? But they want a 2000 watt Henry sitting in there thing with a 220 main there is that you know is it basically a, an auxiliary furnace um but um so that's what qrp is about now you know i like to think that i spend my time i'm a sculptor of electrons and copper that's where i get my fun i mean i like to create stuff and i like to create stuff that makes other people happy uh and and gives them fun and that's the preeminent it ain't fun i'm not in it okay i don't want to do it so, um, and that's why sometimes with me being the ex toy designer, it has to also be a little bit on the wacky if I'm doing it. Okay, so, um, so you know this this whole thing. I wanted to do a demonstration of. Okay, it doesn't take much. Here's a board I designed specifically for this little presentation, and it's a power supply. You know, it's a little simple little power four four volt power supply. Now, if you went down there in the flea market and tried to buy a four output quad output power supply for your QRO rig, you were going to be prepared to shell out some money. I know I did. You know, I shelled out, I think, $100 for a four output uh, bench supply. Now, this isn't an overwhelmingly big uh, supply. It's only 100 milliamps per, um, per output. Well, that's not a lot, but in QRP worlds, that's enough. And get my other show and tell. This is the other six boards on the panel. Okay. This one was down here on the end. Okay. That was a panel of seven kits. I started here and I said, well, I ought to put a transmitter and receiver with it. And then I said, well, if I got a transmitter and receiver separate, I better do a, a, a automatic switch. Now I got up, but maybe I have a keyer there too. So I put a keyer on there. Oh, maybe I have an antenna coupler. So this is a complete rig on seven little teeny boards. And this will power everything on there. No problem. Now, again, because it's simple. These are all simple circuits. Here's a sudden receiver that, you, that a QRP has seen that represented umpty ump million times. There's all kinds of rigs that use the sudden receiver and they might change the name. In my case, I call it a sudden storm because it's a sudden receiver. Um, and I have a lot of nautical names because I grew up in the water. Um, this one right here is a WBB, a world's biggest billathon 20 meter transmitter. This is the same kit I did for those 246 people. Um, and this, uh, this TR switch is what I call a tuna helper. Um, so all these things have, have got references someplace else, but now they're all on one panel. Easy builds and been simplified. So we're gonna build this sucker. If you open that, this thing up, you'll find 
very carefully because things might fall out. Now, uh, again, this is just an exercise to show you that if you take your time and you follow the directions and, and look at the silk screen carefully, you can build pretty much anything. I, I saw complete dweebs when it comes to building, build K2s. And I also saw them come to my shop and make me help them for like a week on end to fix their mistakes <laughs> because you know they just put things in backwards or whatever. I repaired many a K2 in my shop at lunchtime to all my cl fellow club members. We got, we got a complete one up there? Okay, it wasn't hard, was it? Okay. <laughs> If you think about any QRP, I mean, most of my kits have less than 75 parts on them. So this has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I got 11 parts in this little kit, okay? Which is, you know, a more sophisticated kit like, well, for instance, here's a, here's a sudden receiver of the same design. And that's got... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. Basically 36 parts for a complete direct co conversion receiver. You just did 11 parts. So, okay, it's three times more difficult. That's not rocket science, okay? But the beauty about QRP is the fact that now you can play around with this thing. I, the first comment I had when I showed it to somebody was, well, why didn't you put a 3.3 volt regulator? Well, I don't use 3.3 volt parts, okay? So I didn't need one, but you can lift the five volt regulator out and plunk a 3.3 and you got a 3.3 power supply. It's your, it's your kit, you can do anything you want with it. Once you understand what it is and how it works, you make mods. Hardly anybody, any QRP who goes along and just takes a kit for what it is, first thing they want to do is mod it. Everybody there? We almost there? Okay. You lose anything? Look at this guy. Have you ever built anything before? He's not a QRP. -er. Never built anything before. He's all got fat fingers. He's got it built. Okay. Hey. <laughs> okay. You got it yours built? I mean, they're all. How many people got it built on so far? Look at that. Okay. It didn't take hardly any time at all. Now, if you want a challenge, there's six more kits. <laughs> but but if you if you think about it, okay, here's another kit. This is a dummy load kit. Okay. That's got one, two parts on it. If you go down there looking for a dummy load in the in the in the thing, if you were a QRO guy, what would you expect to pay for a dummy load? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, seriously, into the 30, 40 pounds, even if it's a cheesy one, okay, a, a good one is gonna cost you quite a little bit of money. This one is this part, this one res, uh, resistive in, uh, inductive, zero inductive load, 15 watt resistor costs four bucks. That's not bad, you know, and an RCA connector, and you got yourself a dummy load. That's what we're talking about in the fact it's inexpensive to go QRP. When I was getting into this, I, I had a 750 watt transceiver. It was a uh, Swan CRX 750, and I was so afraid to even transmit with it because, oh, the tubes in there, once they pop, they're hard to get a hold of. They cost a fortune. So I listened on it only. I did not transmit on. I didn't dare put the transmit button on because if I blew the thing, I couldn't afford it because I had a kid. I had a mortgage on my house that was like killing me. Um, now this is in the in the 90s when uh, you know I think the interest rate on my house was 21 percent. 21 percent. I was paying over. You know, I was three points over prime if I remember correctly. I mean, prime was like at 18 percent in the U.S. back in the late 90s. And I, when I bought my house, it was a der derelict and I fixed it all up, but, but it didn't have central heat. So you had to go for one of these bad loads. <laughs> so yeah, it was costing me a lot of money. So next to it, I had my, 50, my Argonaut 509 and my 
uh, Tentec PM1A, which was a really early QRP kit. Um, so, okay, now here's, I can guarantee you that if I had this one kitted up, uh, hang on, let me find my show and tell stuff. Yeah, okay. So here's, here's a little board. It's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. It's got like 23 parts on it. That is a 20 meter transmitter. And with a little bit of modding, it's a 20 meter transceiver. Now, it don't put out much, okay? Cause it's only got one transistor, but it's a start, okay? And the thing about a lot of QRP guys, I mean, I know some people take the challenge and at first they, <laughs> first they work the world on five watts, which is our legal maximum, okay? Then they say, well, that was too easy. I'm gonna do it at one watt. They do that and they said, that's too easy. I'm gonna do it at hundred milliwatts. Then they go down to here where they get 30 milliwatts, okay? But still, I can guarantee you that if you made a contact on 30 milliwatts across the channel, you would be jumping for joy on a kit that you built and it took you all of eight minutes. You build a kit and send it over, you, know, you, you put it on an antenna. I mean, this, this will work on the best antenna or the shittiest antenna you got. But if you got it on a good antenna, you could probably actually work over in the Europe with 35 milliwatts why you need one kilowatt, okay? But again, with only like 20 parts, it's only twice as difficult as this one. Now, once you learn how to solder, the whole world opens up because most of the kits are solder-based kits and these kits can be soldered, you know, all the parts can be soldered. But, you know, your, your I think your enthusiasm and your um, confidence level goes up when you learn how to solder. You can go to my website, which is on the board, qrpme.com, and you can uh, go down to my Billathon uh, CV and go down and you can find, or actually take any one of the QSO Today live stream Billathons that I've done, and you go to any one of those and you go and there's a whole big long list of my YouTube things, and there's a learn to solder. I did you know a, a one whole, I think it was a two hour session on learning how to solder. And then the next night I did another one learning to unsolder. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit more tricky, but once you learn how to solder and then learn how to unsolder, your world really opens up because a lot of times you make a mistake and say, oh crap, I gotta fix that. How am I gonna fix that? Well, unsoldering is just as easy as soldering. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit more tedious. But the point is once you get that first couple of kits down and your confidence goes, you haven't, number one, you haven't busted your budget because you spent very little money. I mean, right now you've built a kit and you spent no money at all. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Okay. But, you know, you, you're going to spend 20 or 30 pounds over here. I have to say dollars over there. It's not much. Um, and you can go places. Uh, I think the most expensive kit I sell is the is the switch inductor tuner or the rock mite, which is a transceiver, that's 50 bucks, uh, not expensive. And, and that's a transceiver, a lot of people, I mean, there's 15,000 people who bought a rock mite and they use it for hiking and they use it for going up and doing soda. Now it puts out a half a watt, but you couple that with your second kit, which would be a five watt amplifier. You put half a watt in, you get, five watts out and a cheesy uh, pole, bamboo fishing pole or what have you with a wire on it. And what's young Collins call sign? BTT. No, not that's tall Colin, young Colin. He, <laughs> you know, young Colin, he did, he did the soda yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was on the cover. He did the soda. He took a rock my kit up to the top. It's snowing. He built the an, he built the transceiver, he built the key, he built the antenna in his pup tent, snow all over the place. He put it up and he did a soda, summits on the air, okay? And it was a goat because he had so many people trying to contact him, he became a goat instantly. <laughs> it was a challenge, but it was a fun challenge. Um, 
some I don't know why I, I somehow I missed a couple of slides I think um you didn't see that slide <laughs> um now somehow I missed it uh, I thought I had one in there um I did a talk in Washington, just outside of Washington, D.C., about QRP. And why? Why do people do QRP? Uh, I mean, generally, when you're doing QRO stuff, we all know what QRO and QRP, you know, the difference between them. Big, heavy shit that plugs into the mains. Little stuff that's battery operated. Cheap. Okay. Well, those QRO guys, you know, they're locked in their shacks down in the basement or out back or over the garage or what have you. Um, but the guys doing QRP... And I did this whole thing. Here's the QRO guy, you know, stuck in his shack. Here's the QRP guy. He's riding a bike, a recumbent bike, with his rig in the in the. Uh, and he's and he's actually mobile at the time, doing QRP on a bike. Okay. And there's another guy doing QRP hiking. Another guy doing kayaking or canoeing or just plain hiking. I had all these pictures. They're all the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> No, not really, but I, it just happened. He's a friend of mine, and he's very active, but he can take his radio wherever he goes. And it's not big. You know, he can just stuff it somewhere. He stuffs it in his, in his rucksack. But he has, uh, yes, it's not a sea biscuit. I had a slide with him on it in a kayak, okay? And it's w1pid.com is his website. And he puts out these beautiful you know, I biked up to the Passamuaca River, okay, and uh, found a nice boulder and he sits on it and he throws a piece of wire up in a tree and he, and he lists the contacts he made with Czechoslovakia and Poland. This is from New Hampshire with a piece of wire and a five watt transceiver. And he has, I swear to God, there's at least uh, 200 of these mini adventures. You've been doing it for 20 years. And he does it all the time. And he's hiking, he's kayaking, he's everything. Um, but that's the point is the fact that you're not lugging something big. So wherever you go, if you're going to the beach, you can just throw up a wire in the tree and see if you're going to the beach. Now I had three guys, two of them from LobsterCon, um, uh, C-Blind, AA1MY, who was a big antenna guy and loved flying kites with antennas hanging off of them. And then I had the Mr. Mr. Kayaking, biking, hiking, uh, canoeing guy. He was a buddy, and they live relatively close together. And this Michael Rainey from Vermont. And they came over and said, you know, you grew up on this beach. Is there any way we can get access to the beach? I said, yeah, I'll go get my uncle's house. So we got his cottage, which was right next to our cottage. And he came out and he put radios. He had tons of radios going down right over the water, right into the salt water. <laughs> Coming all coming into the front porch of the house, and then he put up a 12 foot, I think it was a 12 foot Scott sled at about 600 feet with a full wave vertical dropping down at 160. Okay, and this video on my website of him tuning his radio up, his goal was to be able to hop across the Atlantic on 160 on a vertical hung from his kite. And he's tuning up his radio and Russia comes on and he had about just about had a heart attack. OK, then the second guy, Michael Rainey, he's coming over and he's got what they call a code. He, he designed it and he called it a code talker. Anybody hear about the Navajo code talkers? Remember that kit, that design? You speak into a speaker and you use it as a micro uh, as a power generator to power his 20 meter transmitter. OK, going into the antenna. So he was doing Dash, dash. You know, he's really speaking loudly in this thing is right in the face okay he's trying to go across the pond with voice power it takes all kinds <laughs> it does it takes all kinds and qrp i think is the best way of fitting in me i like to shove stuff in cans and and create fun things you know he wanted to, he did all these crazy things but that code talker took the cake you know, I mean, uh, you know, he's shouting, and he's getting red in the face. He didn't get anywhere. OK, <laughs> I sad to say he didn't get anywhere, but he did get South Carolina from that house. So he and that, that code talker was doing gray line all the way down the Atlantic seaboard. Yeah. QRP works. QRP is simple. QRP is cheap. QRP is educational. 
why would anybody choose anything else? <laughs> I rest my case. Okay. Now, now does anybody have any questions? <laughs> or, huh? How tall is your daughter? <laughs> my daughter is about the same height as me now. What is five foot two? Okay. Now, she, she and my wife are coming over to London on at Heathrow on Tuesday. I meet up with them, and then we we train over to Paris. We're going to do two weeks in Paris before I go home. But I don't. I have pictures of her. Um. Just another side. How much time? Are, have I got, we, got any time left? We've got uh, nine minutes. Nine but minutes I um, oh, we no. may have questions online, and oh, if we've got questions, oh, questions in the room. Online, shall, shall we, Anthony, are there any questions online? I forgot about the online part. <laughs> I'm sorry. There's no questions. Right. Uh, we got one question. Uh, let's see who has their hand up. Uh, John, go ahead. M zero. <laughs> Yeah, Mike Zero, Julia Fox Echo. Um, just to say a big thank you for Simon. Uh, I have a brain injury and it's helped with memory and stuff. Okay. Bits back, so just to let you know it was used as a lifesaver for disability. Thank Thanks. you for that, John. That's great to uh, to hear. As I say, the online access, uh, is, uh, it takes a little bit of setting up, but it's clearly worth it because people are, uh, are, are tuning in. Are there any questions in the room? Pocket Simon. Come on. Okay. Just just one moment. One moment. How much are the lobsters? <laughs> With your lobster fest. Really good idea, but they're so expensive over here. We have to have fish and chips instead. Well, I know. Yeah. I, I was at Mercatory just the other night, but it was awfully good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, my lobster budget's about uh, usually between a thousand and thirteen hundred dollars for the lobsters we eat. Uh, between sixty and a hundred. Yeah, a big bit. Yeah, so it, and anybody who wants to uh, to sample the wares, uh, it, uh, it it's always well advertised, and uh, I'm sure there'd be <laughs> any anybody yeah, traveling from this side of the pond would be I'm, very happy to uh, to be welcomed yeah. there. I've been doing it for 24 years. It's a long time, so I'm getting older and uh, more decrepit as I go along. But uh, yeah, this year we had a 175 pound pig roasted right there smoked right next to the where we cooked the lobsters and we ate ourselves silly with pulled pork <laughs> pulled pork sandwiches on Friday night for free and all you can eat pulled pork on Saturday for free. <laughs> um, but yeah I mean I charge fifty dollars for the weekend and you and you pay ten dollars a night for, for camp. I mean it's a bargain and and there's a salmon con out salmon con out in uh, Washington, that's pretty much the same, only they, they eat salmon instead of lobsters. Um, there was a gator con down in Florida. <laughs> no one wanted to go to that one. <laughs> there was an armadillo con out in uh, Texas, and no one went, went to there after the first one because it was too friggin' hot. <laughs> so, but but the whole idea about QRP, you get two QRPs together, that's pretty good. But if you can get four or five of them together, you can do all kinds of fun things. You know, that's it's pretty easy and it's easy to take stuff some places I mean, why would anybody choose care i sold all of my qrc i don't even think about think about doing anything that's not ultra portable well i think on that happy note i think it's time to to draw close um please once again thanks to rex for for a very entertaining end to the convention and okay thank you to everyone for joining us online and um, as I say, next year is the 50th anniversary. We will be doing something special. Don't know what it is yet, but we'll let you know in good time. Uh, and, and again, a big shout out to the Telford Amateur Radio Club for putting this event on and helping us to to uh, to make this as, uh, as as easy as possible. If you've enjoyed it, great. See you next year. Uh, hope that's been a, a great afternoon and uh, have a safe journey home. Seven, okay. three, one and all. <laughs>